Hey folks, we are talking about Star Trek Picard Season 2, Episode 2, Penance. We're going to do a spoiler-free review of the episode, and then we're going to do a spoiler breakdown of the episode, starting now. Welcome to the Nerd Soul Show. I'm Nathan. I'm John. And I'm, I'm David. So the spoiler-free logline of this episode is Picard finds himself transported to an alternate timeline in the year 2400, where his longtime nemesis Q has orchestrated one final trial. Picard searches for his trusted crew as he attempts to find the cause of this dystopian future. John, what did you think of this episode? It's another mirror universe slash alternate reality type of episode within a Star Trek within a Star Trek universe. And those episodes are always very fun for me. And uh, you get to see a lot of the actors portray characters that are usually not the way you expect them for one reason or another. And this was no different. So I, I found a lot of enjoyment seeing how these guys were trying to fake it till they made it. And they, especially with other characters in this particular world. So it, it set up a nice premise, intro, reintroducing Q in this way, using him in this way. And uh, so we got to see a lot of the characters in very different situations and trying to figure out where they are with all of it. And, and again, uh, a very fun for me to see that. Let's see where it goes. I do wish uh, we could spend more time there, but I think it's about to jump into a different uh, world. So we'll go into more and uh, more of that in the uh, spoiler review. Okay. David, what'd you think? David, I think you're muted. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> I said, before, I was saying that this is, I really enjoyed this one here. At first it was a little bit slow, but then further into the episode, we get to see and get a, an idea of what's going to happen. What we should expect in this season but i like that how the how we get to see these characters all is like thinking what's going on here and they figure out what to do next and everything so i'm looking forward to see what's going on okay colin yeah i really enjoyed this episode i think that like i said in the previous week about the first episode it was very interesting to see how uneven it was season one was i watched the ending parts of season one but then as i got into this first last week's episode it was very compelling this week's episode was also very compelling there were a lot of things that you saw that they harkened back to that was really great and we'll get into that during the spoiler review but but definitely kept you wanting more and then even at, toward the end of the episode, it really kept you still compelled and still wanted to see what's happening overall. So I think that it was a pretty solid episode. And I'm very cautiously optimistic that they're not going to go off the rails or do something that's going to have a twist. that's going to be like, oh, no, what's going to happen? And I can mention about all those kind of, I would say, self-doubts that I have about the about Picard in the spoiler review. Yeah, I I think it was a great episode. I It was very dark for anyone who caught our attempt at a review earlier in the week when uh, we had audio issues. We talked about the fact that it, it was dark, but it was dark in a somewhat realistic way as opposed to some of the like mirror universe darkness, which is cartoonish slapstick. And I don't know, everyone and everyone in Star Trek was a Klingon is what the, the mirror universe is. But th these people were truly sinister and truly evil. And it was interesting to see what that looked like to differentiate it from mirror universe episodes. There's a scene that I'm not going to talk about now that uh, in a trophy room that's really crazy. But when we talk about it, in, uh, when we break it down in the spoiler review, we'll get into it. But yeah, it was a good episode. I'm looking forward to where they go for the rest of the season because we see in this episode how dire the situation is and how, how much it needs fixing. So I'm looking forward to seeing where, where they go. All right. So if you guys have nothing else, I would say you should go see the episode. It's really good because we're going to get into spoilers because it's difficult to talk about this episode without spoilers. But before we do that, I'll say if you're enjoying the conversation, please join the conversation by commenting down below and like and subscribe to help the channel out. We appreciate it. All right. So spoilers ahead. All right. Where do you guys want to start this episode? I think we can start with Q, just the interaction with Q. Yeah, yeah the Q conversation with Picard is probably the best part of the episode. He's uh, he's acting very acting in this episode. Now, his name is, is escaping me off the top of my head. Sorry, John Delancey. His acting is probably better than he's done in any episode of, of TNG. You, you see a real off the rails. Like, before he was, like, puckish and, like, a Loki character. Like, he's having fun at the expense of people's lives, which is, which can be terrible and sinister but he seems angry and it hits all of his exchanges with Picard and at one point he slaps him so yeah that that's it's crazy 
Uh, so he's acting very well. And I actually, I think I was listening to an interview with uh, Patrick Stewart like a week or so ago. And he was he was saying that he was like in awe of how well John was acting in those in those scenes. And it took him out of it. And he had to remember that he needed to actually respond to those scenes as, as, a, as opposed to just watch him in awe. But yeah, it was he was doing some good work there. But yeah, in this in the beginning, we see that in this world, Picard has slaves. He has Romulan slaves. He has androids, android slaves as well. And he's a... Uh, He's like a not he's not a tyrant, but he's like a bloodthirsty general that that I mentioned a, tro- a, a trophy room. He has the head of General Martok, the head of Gal De, Gata, uh, Gal Dukat from from I guess Martok is also from DS Nine. Q didn't mention the Grand Nagus, but it looks like the Grand Nagus' uh, head is there as well because we see a Ferengi skull and we see the Grand Nagus' mm-hmm. uh, staff. He also killed Sarek. Sa- he killed Sarek, uh, Spock's father as well. So, so yeah, yeah, it's a uh, it's it, and he has he. I think after Q leaves and they have all their exchange, he Picard brings up this this twisted version of of the the general Star Trek speech to boldly go where no man has gone before. Things he's like to boldly conquer, and it's, at the end it's like uh, because a safe humanity, a, a safe galaxy is a human galaxy. So they're basically eradicating everyone in the galaxy who's not human it's crazy it's a crazy it's a crazy world that they find themselves in because even the terrans they subjugated and oppressed people they weren't trying to eradicate everyone mm-hmm. so yeah what did you guys think of this at the beginning i thought of delancey again seeing him again and uh, seeing him the way he is now definitely very refreshing and it's nostalgic at the same time and yes, there was definitely a sense of urgency in the way he was talking to Picard. Mm-hmm. So even Picard mentioned and saying, are you dying? And so there's definitely mystery behind it. And that urgency led to him quickly establishing where to he-, he took him to that new world right away and, uh, and and pretty much gave him nothing like he usually does for Picard to figure it all out. And he even laid it out almost like a dungeon master saying, you're not here alone. And w- whenever they have episodes like this, you always want to see because it's a new world, a different world. You're fascinated by how things are very different. But you do want to see how all the other players, other characters are in this world. So we get to see that with the usual cast. But usually in episodes like this, I, I know the budget doesn't allow for it, but it makes you wonder, hey, how about all the other characters that supposedly are in this world? I know they got the name drop a couple here and there, like Cisco they mentioned. Mm-hmm. And uh, so it's nice to see those little callbacks, but it's, it, it'd be nice if you just walked right in. And I know Avery Brooks would never come in for just one little scene. He, a nice he, little... he hasn't been on television since 2001, so he's not really that interested yeah. in doing television. Yeah, but how nice it would have been to see yeah. something like that. He just pops in and says, uh, yes, Madam President, and no, not you, and, <laughs> and he's mm-hmm. out of there or something. But nice to see, it would be nice to see something like that. But that's just the... Uh, fanboy in me in, in wanting to see scenes like that and yes that throne room i'm sorry the trophy room uh, seeing all those heads how else to establish wow the humans are the predators in this case and, and seeing and of all people sarek really at least the sarek that we know my goodness we assume that he's quite somewhere in that universe and for his head to be on a spike like that it's definitely and definitely sets the tone right away what the heck twisted world is this so if the world were completely nazi and and they're trying to spread that throughout the universe so we're, we're certainly seeing that so yeah it's just the way they established all that very quickly i liked it and off to the races yeah and it was the confederacy of planets was it they call it the confederation, the confederation. Confeder- i don't think they really care about other planets they, they're just talking about the confederation there are other planets there they're going to be planets that are either eradicated or subjugated by by, by earth it's, i think it's yeah. just the confederate it's pretty much what they're referring to with, with yeah. that with that word and stuff like that so I think that, yeah, it was very drawing. But going back to Q, I think for those fans of The Next Generation, Q was definitely, like you said, Nathan, a very whimsical, Loki-ish type of character who does mm-hmm. kill, actually. Who does, if you go back to, to one of his encounters, you know, one of the best TNG episodes was the first encounter with the Borg. He killed people there, even though you didn't see it, but he did. So in, in, in any case, I think that even with all that whimsicality and all that stuff during his TNG run, this was much more serious and dark tones. Mm-hmm. And even I think that for Q, there's definitely much more sinister, much more darker tone to him here. And also for Picard as well. But I think Picard was able to, in some ways, wash that away by saying that I'm getting too old for this type of 
BS from you. You better just stop playing the messing around with me because I'm just way too old to, to deal with this stuff, type of stuff and just get to the point, that type of thing. Much more kind of succinct or direct than any other points in time during the next generation that he had. Whereas whereas I think that he was still, Picard was still like, okay, I'm annoyed by you, but I'll play along. But here is just, just cut the BS, get to the point and just get and just leave me alone. Get me out of here, basically. So that's based, that's where he's at with that's where his headspace is so it would be pretty jarring for those people that watch the next generation and it's just the same thing with season one you, you watch the next generation you love it you're a big fan of it and then this is definitely tonally a much different show than than that yeah it definitely is and i think they're trying to do they, they try to differentiate how dire it was by by making these people far more evil than anything that you've seen before i think that star trek has been dark in other in other places because like i said there's definitely the mirror universe stuff but this stuff is darker than that there was they the herosians were like nazis in a previous episode of uh, voyager they they did the year of hell in voyager as well and so they've been dark before but this is uh, probably dark, the darkest that they've been and when we recorded this earlier, when we had Condra, she mentioned that, that the production value, because they have more money to spend on this, on this show, having a, they probably would have tried to exp how evil they were, but like to have the production value to actually have a trophy room and have skulls and have to like show how evil he is and how evil they are and have things like eradication day and have a stadium full of people like yelling for the execution of someone not just the execution of someone the eradication of a race because she's the last of the, of the race that mm -hmm. everyone's chanting for that yeah it's it's uh they're definitely a degree much much more sinister than the, the than the terrans i think my, my joke earlier was that the terrans if they showed up to this universe there they would be like well, you guys are going too far this is <laughs> this, mm -hmm. this 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 <laughs> yeah yeah. So after Picard realizes what's going on, uh, and he, he gets a notice that he's supposed to show up for the Eradication Day ceremony, and he's supposed to be giving a big speech. So we cut to not Seven of Nine, but Annika Hansen, because in this universe, she never got assimilated, and she is apparently the president of this confederation. So she's trying to get her bearings, and it's very cool to see how quickly she got her bearings. She, she, she just figured out that she's not dreaming. This is not a simulation because she has a pain response. She also has the cognitive ability to do math and things like that. So she's like, yeah, this is real. Now that she's established that it's real, okay, what am I going to do now to make sure that I'm, that I'm safe? So she figures out very quickly. It's a very seven thing. Even though she doesn't have the Borg implants to do like the super fast processing, which is why they need the Borg queen later on, she's still naturally, obviously very smart because her, both of her parents were scientists. So she figures out what she needs to do. She, ha she apparently in this universe has a husband, which is a shock to mm -hmm. her, who's a magistrate. Yeah, who's the magistrate, and he he comes in and he he starts to brief her on the war in Vulcan, and that's when we hear a little bit. She asks for a briefing, and and she's looking on the holopad, and she, she notices Rios's name, and this is when we can get the uh, the Easter egg of Cisco's name. Yeah, it would have been mm -hmm. nice to, it would have been I, I, I don't know, like it would have been nice to see Avery books, but also I don't want seeing a a um a Terran version of Cisco. We've seen that before. And that guy is just like a drunk or whatever. But like a Cisco from this world would be super evil. I don't, I'm not even sure if I would actually want to see anyone who from this world, he, it, it would be terrible. So it would, so I'm mixed on whether or not I would like to see, see Avery walk into the scene, but it would be interesting. Any, anyone from this world, because you got to imagine that whatever Q did, he preserved the memories of only the crew of the La Serena. So not Picard's earlier crew, not his, not the uh, the Enterprise crew. So everyone else would be just evil. And so Riker, Jordy, everyone. But yeah, I don't know. Maybe we will see an, a very evil version of them later on in the season. But it seems like they're traveling back in time by at least the middle of the, the next episode. Uh, so yeah, she tries to connect to Rios. And I think Rios is the next person we see. So he wakes up mm -hmm. and he doesn't know what's going on. He just finds himself in the middle of a firefight. He was on the Stargazer before, but then he finds himself on the Los Moranos again. And and here he's a, instead of a captain, he's a colonel because it seems like they have all like army ranks instead of uh, naval ranks. So mm -hmm. he's a colonel here and he's heading a final attack on Vulcan. Did you guys notice that the... So there, there, there are a couple things to notice. When she was looking through the briefing, 
it said Vulcan, but it also said in parentheses Navarre, which is the designation like a thousand years in the future where Discovery is. So the, the name of the world turned to Navarre when the Romulans and the Vulcans merge. So it seems that under the threat of the of the humans, that happened a lot sooner than it did in in the regular universe. Mm. Because with, with, with a common enemy, it seems that the Vulcans and the Romulans merged a lot quicker. Because when we get to the firefight that Rios was in, there's not just Vulcan ships, there's also Romulan ships in that firefight around Vulcan. So that, mm. that that's a little interesting detail that's in the background. That they, they that's not necessarily broadcast, but you, because I, I think everyone's fighting for their survival against the, the humans because they're eradicating everyone. So it's interesting. So they're pretty much like the conquistadors back in the day, just wiping out everybody. Yeah, as you go along. So yeah, I forget where we go after Rios. Do we go to? Do we go? I think it's Rafi and Rafi and Elnor. Yeah. Elnor is running through the streets of Okinawa, and their I guess terrorists are blowing up towers to commemorate the worlds that have been already destroyed. So it's it, we we listed I think Kronos and a couple others. I don't remember all of them, but I I think they're listing them because Vulcan and Romulus. Okay. Yeah. So I, I guess those are the ones that they've eradicated so far. So they have a bomb for every one of those. But the woman that he was running with, I don't know. What, did she look like she was Vulcan or she she was Romulan? I, I, I didn't catch her ears. I, she got killed very quickly. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't tell because she could be Romulan or it could be uh, Vulcan or even human for that matter because she had some hair that covers the ears. Yeah. Okay. We can't it was too quick. She was dead very quickly. <laughs> but just from her her few lines, we get a sense that they've destroyed countless worlds already. And there are only a few left that we know of. I think they, they mentioned Andoria as well. So they killed the Andorians also. So in this in this scene, Elnor is cornered by a bunch of soldiers. And Rafi steps in, kills all, all of them, and then takes custody of him and lies to people. So she they, they both have their memories as well. And I think then we cut to Gerardi because he she uh, Seven goes to meet with to for the preparation for Eradication Day. And I think in this conversation that she has with the magistrate, she gets information out of him about what Eradication Day is. And as I said earlier, it's just their day celebrating the fact that they're eradicating other species. Yeah. These people are... When they had Gerardi introduced, I noticed that she's pretty much a saint. <laughs> Whereas compared to the other characters, they have, they're vastly different, but so... What, so she's yet another loner with and a cat of a different form. Yeah, I, I found that hilarious. And also, the name is Spot. As yeah, well. and it was also voiced by Patton o o Oswald. So it was a couple <laughs> couple Easter eggs in there. So Patton Oswald shows up in all the sci-fi things and and, and uh, sci-fi and, and also nerd things because he also shows he shows up in Marvel a couple times. So Patton Oswald voices the cat, and it's Spot, which is the name of Data's cat. But I think it was top, Spot forty something or sixty something. I forget what the the exact. 73. 73. Spot 73. Yeah. I, I really hope she brought Spot on the ship. I want to, <laughs> I want to hear more of Spot's uh, sassy uh, breakdown of the, the dystopian future. Because he's, 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 I mean, you are you guys already killed him. I mean, mass executions are is overkill. What's, all, what's wrong with your society? Like, and then he has the meow at the very, it's, it's very like <laughs> monotone meow. Yeah. Yeah. I have to, it's, it's the obligatory meow. Like yeah. That. It's like you programmed me to do say meow. So I have to say it. So fine. Meow. I want to make my point, but. Meow. <laughs> yeah. The, it's the cat meme of the future. Yeah, the cat meme of the yeah. future. Yeah. But I, I was going to point out that Rios looks pretty much the same. Elnor, I, I like that how they keep switching him up in different looks this season. So mm -hmm. it's kind of cool to see how he... Rafi, same thing. She's gone from the last, scene to, last season the way we saw her into a, a Starfleet uniform and then... And now into, what, head of security or chief of security in that outfit. I think she looks fantastic. And, and But, of course, Seven, she looks great in everything. And she definitely pulls it off as a man. As, pres president. as president. Yeah, she definitely, yeah. She's a very authoritative yeah, so like, boss per person and no-nonsense person. So there was like a stroke of genius from the writer, writers. You had to figure out where they're going to be in this world. Having her as president mm -hmm. was like, yeah, <clears throat> in this world, yeah, she definitely would make a good president. So, yeah. Yeah, um, and even Gerardi even said it. She was like, oh, yeah, she's going to own that. Or, or she said something like that. I, yeah. I can't remember exactly how she said it. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, they go to Gerardi's lab. And before before Seven shows up, uh, Gerardi's trying to figure out what's going on. And she's super confused. And she seems to figure out things a lot slower than everyone else. Because when Seven comes in, she says, Seven, and that... And Seven's, what are you doing? Play it cool here. Yeah. And, and, and Gerardi's a, a little bit flummoxed. And then we real, we, we find that, as I, as I mentioned earlier, that the Borg Queen is, is on ice. 
and she's the last mm-hmm. she's the last of the collective to be murdered in a public ex- execution. So yeah, I forget where we go after that. I think we go to the steps of what would have been Starfleet Academy, but it definitely isn't Starfleet Academy now. When Picard is coming into the the building, he knows mm-hmm. he notices Rafi. He notices Rafi and Elnor. And he gets them out of a, a jam because he's she's escorting this prisoner, but mm-hmm. she doesn't necessarily have the authority to take the prisoner away from some interrogators. And then he steps in and, and vouches for her. And then they all go to Annika. And the magistrate at this point is starting to get suspicious. He was suspicious all day because while Seven is trying to do his, his, a, a pretty good job of shutting him up, and she in the direct way that she usually does, and, and just trying to pull off p- presidential... Earlier, she got him to download on all of what Eradication Day is by just saying, by shutting him up when he said that there's something wrong with mm-hmm. She was like, what you need to do is focus on your duties and, and, and remind me what the, 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 the day is about. But at this point, he's had all those little interactions because, again, he's not just the magistrate. He's her husband. So he's going to mm-hmm. notice small things off. And as they accumulate, they're going to be more and more weird. So Picard bringing a prisoner, not just to the president, but to his wife, made him very annoyed. So I can imagine so by the end of the episode, when he says Picard is a traitor, I, I can understand where he's coming from or how he got there because the entire day has been weird for him. But yeah, they convince him that they're going to have a private conversation with this prisoner and the general mm-hmm. and in the and Rafi. So that I, that's when they all get together and they have the conversation about, they download about Q and they start to put, put pieces together. So at this mm-hmm. point, so at this point would they, they actually talk to the Borg queen and they give, and she gives information about what has happened. That it, there was a change in 2024 in Los Angeles, and they need the Borg queen to calculate the the, tri- the the mathematical equations to slingshot themselves around the sun to go back into the past. So, Voyage a la Star Trek, Trek 4. A, a la Star Trek 4, but also there's two episodes of TOS as well where they just use the sun to, to go back in time, and Spock does the calculations. Yeah, there are a couple of things here that, that that's interesting. We noted on our page that's this exact same year that uh, Cisco went back as well. He's just in San Francisco. He's not in Los Angeles. I don't know if we're going to see anything there. We already talked about Avery Brooks. Avery Brooks is probably not coming back, but there is a scene... There is a scene in the trailer where Picard is shaking the hand of a black person. Now, that black person could be Avery Brooks, but it also could be Guinan in the past. Because mm-hmm. the other thing that the the other thing that the Borg Queen said is that there is someone there that can help uh, a watcher seek the watcher. Now, it probably makes more sense that it's Guinan than it is than it is Cisco because Cisco was like locked inside the Sanctuary City and and he was trying to recreate the Bell Bell riots. So it's unlikely that he's gonna. We saw that entire episode and he was in there the entire time and then he synced back up with Dax and then they got they got out of there after O'Brien and Kira came and got them from the past. So there probably isn't going to be unless. They are going to, unless they're saying that's what happened the first time, but then because of the change in the time stream, it, there there was some, there was a difference. I, I don't know. But, yeah, probably they're not going to be so convoluted, I would say. And also I think that you mentioned, everyone mentioned about Star Trek Four, but also this is again going back to First Contact. First Contact was about the same plot where you're going back to the past to change the future. So it's a, the they they are borrowing quite a bit from old Star Trek lore, mm-hmm. and going back to what I said before, I was cautiously optimistic about how this season is going to progress. If they start reusing old things like that instead of creating something new. Then yes, some of it is some of it's good, some of it's okay, but if it's not done properly, it's just going to snowball on them. Say that hey, you just borrowed some stuff from what you did in the past. And if you didn't do it as well, then what's the borrowing something from the past? Why don't you just create something new out of it? Yeah, I, I and I definitely hear that concern. I, I would say that in general, star, time travel happens a lot. But if they do the exact mm-hmm. same time travel plot, then there's a problem. But they, they go to back in time a lot. So just generally mm-hmm. having a, a time travel plot like Voyager went back in a few times maybe yes, no they, did. Yeah. they went, well they went back in time to the past once like to the 90s but they went back in time to the they went forward and then general 
or Admiral Jane Janeway came back in time. But uh, I don't true, think yeah. I don't think TNG ever went back in time except for in the movie. TOS, TOS went back in time a few times in the show, mm-hmm. and I went back. In, sorry, go ahead. We also and also uh, Star Trek the uh, the original they did a movie where they went back in time. What's it? I forgot what it's called. Was it the Final Frontier or something? Tra- where they went back in time to find four Star Trek four. Oh, yeah, where they used the birds of yeah. prey. Yeah. Yeah, 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 they yeah. used the, the to go back in time. That's when they got the whales. So, yeah, and First Contact is back in time. And DS9, at least two episodes that were back in time. So they had the, the Bell Riots 2024 episode, but also Cisco went back in time to Kirk's ship as well. So time travel happens a lot in Star, in Star Trek. So hopefully they have a new, a new spin on what's going on here. And it's not the exact same plot as, say, as First Contact or the exact same plot as the Deep Space Nine episode. I, and, and quite frankly, they're going to be, th- those episodes were one episode or maybe two episodes or maybe a movie, which is only an hour and a half, maybe two hours. They have several episodes, so they have a lot more time to tell a more interesting story. So even if they are similar, if they flesh it out more, it'll different enough or interesting enough to be different hopefully we'll see so yeah after that they they de- devise a plan to try to leave with rios because at this point rios is back on earth after being recalled by president hansen so he's there and he's he, and their plan is to fly around the sun but they're on high alert possibly because of all the things that were happening in okinawa all the terrorist explosions so they're and high alert, they have transport blockers, so they have to stall. And Picard, Picard's on, on stage, vamping it. The gun is, like, telling the crowd to make m- more noise. But at, at a certain point, they're like, get on with it already. Kill the Borg Queen. And they eventually get out of there um, with a few seconds to spare because the magistrate starts to go after Picard. And I think that's pretty much the end of the episode. After they get to the ship after they get to the ship they the confederation starts to pursue them and they board the ship and they shoot elnor and then and then that's the, the end of the yeah. episode they're obviously going to get a, get away because we've seen scenes already from the trailers of them in the past but that's how the episode ends we have they have we have the board queen a real a really weird alliance with someone that you cannot trust but i i guess the the devil you know is better than the devil you don't and they know how terrible the Borg Queen is, but they don't. Th- this new world that they find themselves in is even worse than she is in a lot of ways. I, g- I guess the, the humans are assimilating everyone and destroying everyone, as opposed to the Borg Collective. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was a a treat for me to see Anne Worshing as the uh, Borg Queen in the first episode. We only saw her in a mask. Do you or, think that's the same? That. Do you think that's the same queen? I think it's a different queen because they mention so like uh, in this episode they say they they're talking about the Borg Queen. And someone think someone said more like the original kind of Borg Queen, not the Queen from the the Stargazer. I think there's another shooting drop. I think there's a reason that that Queen's face was shrouded. I don't think it's going to be the same okay. Queen. She, I think this Queen is I similar see. to the, all the other ones, whereas that one is going to be this one is uh, the one that, when we get get the time thing figured out, it's going to be revealed to be yeah. some someone else. Mom, I don't think it's, it's Martha. I don't think it's Martha. It's Martha. It's Martha. Martha! <laughs> Save Martha! No, I was going to say, uh, it, it's it's cool to see Anne Worshing because I've seen her in so many different things. Like Runaway, she's on there as well. And 24, at least one season of that. And so to see her in all that makeup and get up, because uh, she, she's normally always portrayed as a very beautiful actress. And uh, to see her on, in all of that was, it, it's a treat for me. It's really cool to see people go get in, out of their, get out of their element on what they're usually used to doing and to see her really play it up as the boar queen that's really nice for me a, a treat for me to see her in that so she looks uh, very hopefully. menacing even locked up in a containment field in, in handcuffs she still looks very menacing and very <laughs> absolutely and also yeah. she's great makeup legs. yeah yeah she has no legs <laughs> no like, legs like, like, legless like floating in in, in in handcuffs yeah. she still seems like a threat they're gonna she carry her around all los angeles or what <laughs> yeah it's kind of weird and yeah men just overall i think we I remember that we talked about in the other recording that about how they did make an alliance with the board back in Voyager and it turned out okay. They did get seven of nine, but, but there were some really tricky moments in that one too, but they had a 
greater enemy for those of you that don't remember was the fluidic space aliens from Voyager. I don't know. Like I said before, if they're rehashing certain things, try to do it better. Don't don't try to like don't try to just repeat it but then make it worse than it was before. And also just overall, I think, yeah, that like I said, cautiously optimistic. But there were definitely some elements of season one. And these are the same people that wrote season one where it dipped here and there. And we didn't mention about the fact that there was, I think we mentioned it last week, is that they, they did do a lot of wiping out of certain things and trying to excuse themselves from having the criticism from before. So just try to prevent that from, from happening this year. Just try to make it very consistent, very consistent in terms of what was done before, but also what you're going to be doing going forward. And I think that fans would appreciate that. But oftentimes they just try to do that and it just doesn't make any sense. And it's just, and it really turns off a lot of the older fans, the OG Star Trek fans, like from TNG and stuff, D Space Nine, from Voyager. And I've talked to a couple of them, like, a few times and it's just yeah they just don't they just don't get the appeal of some of the newer star treks and and also like the more separating by demographics we have prodigy we have lower decks we have discovery we have picard so it's we're it's all splintering the you're splintering the fans and trying to create new fans and and whether or not that's effective, we'll see as it goes. So I think some of that is piss off the old fans, anyways. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so, some of that sounds like old people complaining. Some of it is uh, some of it is legit legitimate because it's it, yeah. it, because we'll say Picard season one was not perfect. It was uneven. They dropped some threads at the end, at the beginning of the season, as you said in the first episode. The why Gerardi isn't in jail explanation was too quickly handled into some weird dialogue. But yeah, it's really hard. It's it, it, like in 2022, it's really difficult to talk Star Trek in a constructive way because you have all these trolls that are talking about it in a obviously disingenuous way where it doesn't really matter what the writers were are doing or the fact that they're trying to do things a little bit different, they will disingenuously attack the show. I feel like whenever we try to do a review, we try to fair about what, what we didn't like and what, what we did without trying to be like bellicose about it being terrible because it's new. I understand that they're trying to do season long arcs. So it's going to be different because they're doing season long arcs. But yeah, mm -hmm. in doing a season long arc, they have to execute. And they executed at 75 to 80% last year, last year with Picard. But there are people that would say that the entire season is crap. The entire season was not crap. They did a lot of good no, things in the, in the last season. And hopefully yeah. they learn from the mistakes from last season and they'll do better in, in this season. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. That's why I said it. I'm like cautiously optimistic about it because I think that there are definitely some things that are great. And they're, from the first two episodes, there's definitely some things that are great. But I just hope that they, they just, again, execute it better make it more consistent so that people can start jumping in on it and, and then care, let it carry over toward their final season. I think it's their, they, they rumored it's their final season. Season three is their final season. They actually just, just finished shooting the last episode like a week ago. Mm -hmm. So yeah, season three will be the last. And hopefully in the next two years or the t next two seasons, we will see everyone from the T TNG era come back at some point. We'll see Jordy. We'll see, we've already seen Data in various forms and probably going to see, we're probably going to see him this Brett Spiner. Brett Spiner. We're gonna probably gonna see Brett Spiner this season as well because we saw him in the background in season two. He's like this hologram in the back. He's so I think they're gonna see a version of him in the past also because that's how they that's that's how they do Brett Spiner's a character. Apparently the Sung uh, genes are very strong because they look like each other every single generation and they're all mad scientists. So yeah, uh, data because he's an artificial entity. But yeah. Yeah. But as Colin, oh, I'm sorry. But as Colin pointed out a while ago, like trying to do something different and trying to do something new, and at the same time, because this plot where they're going back in time is just like First Contact, where in, but in First Contact they went to the time period where the Borg is trying to prevent First Contact, where the warp drive has been detected by what's it Vulcan? I think it's. But while it's this Vulcans. time we don't know what's going to happen in two thousand, what's going to happen in two thousand twenty-four, except we saw like a ancestor of us. What's his name? The professor's name again. So soon, so, yeah, soon's ancestor mm -hmm. meet Q, but we don't know what it is. But we everyone had thought that it's, it's that point in time that made the timeline change. But we don't know what is that conversation with detail, details about. And then we don't know who exactly the watcher is. Could be Guinan, could be, or could be what's his name, Jake Cisco for God's sake. I don't know. Could be an ancestor as well. Or and as for being like the original TNG characters, 
maybe we might see their ancestors in 2024 versions of them. You say ancestors of Riker, ancestors of Tr you can't expect Troy because she's half human. Okay, but, okay, so it could be an ancestor of a human half yeah. or something like that, yeah. or maybe a. Oh, heck, even the ancestor of Spock's mother, Amanda. Yeah. So, who knows? So, maybe we might see some of TNG uh, original characters as their ancestral form. Maybe, yeah, since they do that with Brett Spiner all the time, they definitely could do it for someone else. They look like one of their ancestors. Um, so, yeah, I, I think... I The other thing that we talked about when we tried to record this the first time is that I don't think that Q is the reason that this is happening. I think Q is trying to help. What do you guys think about that? Like, they, they're operating under the assumption that Q messed up something in 2024 and they have yeah. to go and they have to go and fix it but I, I think that q is doing the best that he can without interfering too much to fix the mistake that picard made because what he said to him in the beginning of the episode was that i was looking for my old friend john luke and all i had to do was go by go find the, the largest explosion so i think it's the explosion mm -hmm. i think it's the self-destruct explosion that he that picard did in front of that obviously that obvious tear in space they already said it was temporal right like that the borg cube um, emerged from uh, that temporal tear in space he set off an explosion that not sh not just exploded his ship but exploded every ship in the fleet that was that was there it definitely right. probably rippled through time and did something so yeah and and again i think that you may be right on the on how it's q is not really involved i think that going back to the tng final episode q really didn't do anything in that episode he wasn't the initiator it was picard who actually opened the anomaly <laughs> sorry yeah. can't say that word correctly but he was the one who was responsible for that kind of going back in time anti-time equation and stuff like that so it's so yeah it could be that this is the same case where it did the self-destruct and then it rippled through time and it opened a opened some type of rupt ruptured some type of something in space time mm -hmm. so that's what ended up happening again and you would think that he had learned his lesson after the, the last learned his lesson nope he didn't learn the lesson he's still gonna auto destruct it. he hesitated he hesitated a bit like like so there's a couple things that's going on in that scene that when he blew up the ship at the end of the last episode so like he has it if you remember from first contact Worf was like blow up the ship and he's like, I won't blow up the ship. And he was like, and he called Worf up like a coward. Uh, so he hesitated the first time. So now he doesn't want to hesitate like he did the lap he did when, in first contact because a Borg is, and is, and the Borg is assimilating a ship and should, should, they should destroy the ship. But he also has gone through the experience from the first season where he softened a little bit on the Borg. He sees the Borg as victims when he went to, when he sees the XB. So where Seven, and we talked about this as well, isn't softened at all because Seven's experience is much more traumatic. Whereas he's traumatized by being assimilated by the Borg. He was probably assimilated for a couple of days, maybe a week, where Seven saw her parents killed and she has assimilated from, a ch from childhood all the way to adulthood. So she doesn't trust the Borg at, at all. So she didn't want, she didn't want the Borg transporting to the ship she did what the, she, she was like very quickly quick to say detonate the, the ship so yeah her trust is uh, is not there at all for the board yeah. i just got one thing here let me hear me out there okay we saw that q is very very up not as upbeat and whimsical as he was before but it looks like he's worried about scared about something and then and you remember this this is a theory then the board and when the board showed up in a some temporal like an anomaly thank you very much colin that the anomaly comes in it came into my mind about why is the is q scared of the borg or is it something that the q knows because even that he won't say to Picard because he wants to that's the thing that's the thing with q always quite like leaves a riddle in some sorts to Picard and leaves Picard to figure it out because q knows something but he doesn't want to say it because he thinks that it would mess up either a timeline or give the answer but my guess is maybe that maybe the Borg somehow, I don't think, this is a theory of anyway, what if the Borg somehow assimilate the Q continuum, which is how they can create that big giant temple anomaly and also create that those multiple ways of languages all in one because the Q continuum can can out can also translate on to understand those links. So that's a theory though, that maybe he's scared because like, the Borg somehow found a way to assimilate the Q continuum. And he could be the last one. That's why he probably leaves a good card because why would he show up? He could have show up during those past 30 some years ago from the finale of TNG up to now. 
But why now? In the when the destruction of the Stargate. So my guess is I don't know, so. but I will say if you watch Discovery, the the plot that's going on this season, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna spoil the plot altogether if you haven't been watching it. But they did mention there's a big threat this season, and at the beginning of the season when they encounter this threat, there's all these different scenarios thrown out and they say and they don't know who's causing it there's they list a bunch of people who are super or races that are super powerful like the q and like the iconians if you remember the iconians are the ones that could transport anywhere by just going through those doors and they said they haven't spoke they haven't seen the q for several hundred years so something is going to happen to the q they mentioned it in Discovery because they said that they checked, they, they crossed the Q off the list of people who could be causing the thing in the future because the Q haven't been seen in a very long time. So I don't know. Something might be happening to the Q continuum. I, I don't know if it's the Borg assimilating them or something else, but he definitely seems impatient, more worried than he more worried than he has been in the past. Because you've seen him worried for himself when the Q stripped him of his powers, but he seems like there's like an existential threat that's gonna that's shattering all of all everything that he knows thing he's very impatient with picard so i guess we'll see that in the few in the past he seems so the the q continuum seems so far removed from corporeal beings like the borg that it doesn't make sense to me that they could be assimilated by the borg but who knows maybe the borg maybe the borg assimilated a, a much more advanced uh, civilization that that uh, could get give them the power to get to the Q continuum, I don't know, but it's definitely I guess, there's definitely a never shoe to drop later on because Q is not saying something, and there there is something going on beyond what he said to John Luke in, in the beginning of this episode. So, yeah. All right, guys, do you have any other thoughts, predictions, ideas about what's going on the next couple? No. I'll have one question though. I'm not sure you guys noticed this. Do you notice that there's a some dialogue or a conversation between Gerardi and the Borg? So they make you thinking, what's going on? Yeah, here? they they definitely seem sure. there's definitely yeah she definitely looks like she's she's very she's zoning in on Gerard and there's <clears> all <throat> these looks between them, and if you see the scene from the next episode, she's also she's looking at her like like a target like a target for grooming like you said John but also it's every person who plays the Borg Queen plays her in a slightly different way but generally speaking this is actually a comment I, I think from Jesse Gender's channel she looks like in a lot of instances, like she could either kill you or she wants to screw you. <laughs> and it looks like it's difficult. It's difficult to tell what she's looking at Gerardi with, but it's like a mix of those two things when she's looking at Gerard, like uh, Gerard, Gerardi. So I, there's definitely something's going to happen between the two of them. I'm not sure what, but we shall see. Maybe Gerardi doesn't leave the ship and she has a guard, the, the Borg Queen in the past, so she doesn't get in and basically do, do, try to do a first contact thing. And, and because she's in close quarters with her for so long, she starts to corrupt her or something. But I don't know. There's definitely something going on. Something is going to go on with the two of them, I think. All right. You have heard what we think, but we want to hear what you guys think. So please comment down below to join the conversation and like and subscribe to get more content like this. And we will see you next time. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye, everyone.